All right, uh, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. I know uh, we're close to a thousand people on the line and we're expecting about 1400 today from all across Ontario, from all of the different sectors that uh, the Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and uh, Culture Industries represent. Uh, I know that this recent stay at home order has been uh, very difficult for many. Um, and I know that we're all very tired of COVID-19. And I know it's been very difficult in some of our outdoor sectors, particularly those that are seasonal, that would like to reopen at this particular moment during the stay at home order. Uh, I'll have Dr. Williams speak to that a little bit. Um, and I do recognize that this has been a, a very difficult issue, but we are continuing to work with uh, Dr. David Williams, our Ministry of Health and the command table on what those reopening plans are, as well as with the Jobs and Recovery Committee. And I personally requested some clarity around thresholds and criteria for our sectors. That work is ongoing, uh, but that's not what we're here to announce today. Today, uh, we wanted to make sure that you understood that we are continuing that work, that funding as committed to you will continue to flow as we did last year to put you in a solid financial position and the best position you can be in given the circumstances. Um, and that I will be doing a major tourism announcement this Thursday um, that will sig will send significant uh, funds into our uh, areas. Um, there will also be a major announcement later in the month on Ontario Place, which is something that is I, I committed to as being a centerpiece for our economic recovery here uh, for tourism, culture and sport. But today's focus is a lunch and learn um, to support the public health protocols and to learn more about those, as well as to uh, look at the data and public opinion research. Um, and then, of course, uh, I'm hoping all of, all of you have uh, ordered takeout or delivery from your local restaurant. Um, and if we've done that, and we have 1,400 people on this call, then 1,400 meals uh, would have been ordered at restaurants across Ontario. And I think that this should be the beginning of, uh, of our hashtag uh, local for lunch campaign. Um, as I said, uh, we've been doing ongoing work with not only the health table and, and, and uh, Daryl Bricker has been doing work with the ministry to help us prepare, uh, but we've also had the Tourism and Economic Development Recovery Task Force meeting. Uh, they will be reporting to me very shortly with some incredible ideas that I believe will help every region across the province. I know in terms of sport recovery, we continue to have conversations with not only our amateur um, and uh, high performance and, and professional athletes, but also uh, more recreational. And so those plans are coming in place and we continue to, uh, to flow funding to our PSOs and that work will continue. And uh, finally, uh, I just wanted to, uh, to say thanks to all of you for your understanding, your patience and, and your kindness in working with me and my team. And so again, um, just before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to uh, remind everybody if, you're, if you've ordered in today, hashtag local for lunch, give me a tag, let's get this trending, let's support Ontario's restaurants as we learn from our public health and public opinion uh, experts. So um, our first speaker is Dr. David Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ontario. Uh, I probably spend, as the rest of the cabinet does, about 20 hours a week with him in our meetings. Uh, he has been very kind and generous um, with his time to support uh, this ministry uh, because of our, our special needs with being the hardest hit sectors. And uh, today I thought it would be great if uh, the trusted voice of Ontario's public health could uh, speak to us today and uh, share some of his insights. So Dr. Williams, I'll pass it over to you and I understand that you have a deck for us today. Yes, well, thank you, Minister. I hope you can hear me okay. And thank you everybody for giving me a few minutes of your valuable time. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your takeout lunch. Um, <clears throat> I've tried to make it a point all the way through from first wave on a uh, certain day of the week, we always order in something and make sure we uh, add a tip on top of that to thank them for their part and doing what they can as everybody we're pulling together on this doing together and uh, so I want to give you an update on how well we're doing collectively and this is everyone pulling together uh, to come out of this one uh, in a very strong and positive way as we've been trying to um, deal with the various iterations including the variants of concern and moving ahead on that and I think um, so <clears throat> I've enjoyed working with uh, Minister McLeod and the team and I know our team's been working with them. Uh, we have worked hard with some areas, especially, um, as you know, our successful work at different stages with the NHL and got them open and doing all the things they've done with a fantastic job of keeping things under control. Now we gotta see if they get through the playoffs and if your home team wins, well, I guess that's great. We hope the best on that. <clears throat> so if we go to the slide deck, let's look at the slides here. And I'm gonna walk you through a number of things to say. We'll go to the next slide, whoever is controlling. Thank you very much. And you can see here, <clears throat> Um, where we're at. 
Uh, it's been a long haul and everybody's been pulling on this one. I think what we're trying to avoid is you've seen in some countries where they say we're out of it and all of a sudden they're right back into it and you get places like India where you end up with a whole area of disaster that four weeks ago they said it's over, we're on a free run and things are back to normal and how fast it can change. And we don't want to go there. That would be disastrous. So we're moving steadily forward on this one here. You can see we're dealing with a very big third wave that came on top of us even when before we were out of the second wave. And our ICUs were up to maximum. We forecast that we could go way above 1,000. We're holding. We've dropped below 900. We're dropping down into the low 800s. So we are making inroads on that and success. But that depends on how many people are getting ill in the community and how many are going into the hospitals. And we found out with the variants of concern, it's no longer just the elderly people. <clears throat> it's the younger people getting sick and some getting sick very quickly. And so we can't be too presumptive on what's happening and where we are in some areas where we think it's nothing happened in our area and before you know it it's right in your backyard and moving quickly in there but we are making success on this why i'll talk about that in a moment so you can see here's our timelines here we were concerned on that with bringing the emergency break in on the third to say that's so we're doing in ontario instead of everything all at once we asked different areas through our framework to come into control knowing it isn't homogeneous throughout the province and trying to be understanding of that, trying to work with you and your communities and your community response, how you're dealing with things. But we still had to put the emergency break on because things with the variants of concern were no longer just sequestered in some parts of the province. It started happening everywhere, even in the far north. And we were very concerned about some of our isolated communities, especially some of our First Nation communities. We then added on the 7th with some more things around the uh, uh, Civil Protection and Emer Communities Act EMCPA and uh, EMPCA, sorry, get that backwards again. And we brought those controls in. <clears throat> and they're in effect with a stay at home order added on the 16th of April. So these different steps coming down, getting a bit closer to that to say we're going to have to get control in here without compromising everything all at once. And we've dealt that. We had to keep our schools closed. We're trying to look at now how can we open the schools back up again as we, these are valuable areas that we want to say the last to close, the first to open. So those are the steps we come in here because we're staging it down. And as we said, it's that dimmer switch we talked about in the first wave. We've closed it down. We haven't just turned everything off. And now how do we open it back up again? Next slide. Let's talk about that. Here's the things here. <clears throat> Our ICU numbers are still up. We're still above where we were at the peak of the second wave. Uh, so we are people saying, well, the numbers are improving. We're not out of the woods yet. We're making progress. We're dropping the numbers. I'll talk about that in a moment. Our variants of concern are high. We're up to that peak level. And uh, when we started the second, third wave, it was down around 50%. It's now up to 85 to 90%. But our overall return around 78, coming down to 75 to 73, we're coming down there. Our ICU numbers, we're at close to 900. We're now down to 840. We're making headway. We're coming back down again. Remember, we started off being worried about being over 150. We have a ways to go yet. The good news is our vaccination is really rolling out. And that's our what this difference of this wave versus the others. And with that, we are over 40%. We're heading to up to 50% of our population eligible. We've added now permission to do 12 to 18 year olds. How do we build that in there? So we have all these things moving very quickly and we hope to be able to get to 65%, maybe even 70% by the end of May. That is a big deliverable, but it's one I think we can work on. And it's one I think in Ontario we can achieve. That means major changes and stuff that we want to look at. And how is that going to drive our numbers down? That will tell us what we can open up. And we have those trends here at the bottom of our provincial emergency break and how we're going to come into a different framework. Next slide. This is the one you've seen from the modeling table. And I think the important one to look here. It's going to be a bit of an eye tester for you with your computers or your iPads. <clears throat> you can see those case numbers, the second wave uh, going into the third wave. And you can see that from the modeling table said, are we going to be in the red line, the yellow line, or the green line? Back about two weeks ago, we were definitely in the yellow line. That means it shows you that our cases were going to just dip a bit and go way up back up around 4,800. Um, <clears throat> and I like to say with our vaccination and we're moving fast, we are not there. If you can get a fine line, and I don't have the marker here to show you, if you look around about the 8th or 9th of May, where you've seen that marker between the fifth of, the 6th of May and the 13th, 
you can see now, instead of being on the yellow line where we were two weeks ago, we're halfway between the green and the yellow. <clears throat> and I think if we keep driving at this, we'll get ourselves down to the green line. That's where I wanna see us go. As you can see, if we get down to the green line, our cases dip down and we lift them to some things off in about that time, we stay down and that keeps the numbers there. So I would say, so far, our public health measures, the state home order, that stuff we're delivering, we're coming down. And today we're at 2,700. It looks like our numbers tomorrow will be about the same number. So this week, can we go down to the mid 2000s? The next week, can we go down to around 2000 and steadily move down? As those numbers drop, the number of people going to the hospital drop, the number going to the ICU drop, the more we can get people repatriated back to the hospitals, open up those hospitals again, get relief and break for our hospital staff and also uh, care for things. Next slide. This is the ICU numbers. You can see on the yellow, uh, the orange one, we've peaked out on the top. We're starting to come down. This is only to the end of April. We need a bit more current updated one. And our ICU numbers, I can tell you the red ones, have plateaued and are starting to come down. Well done. We're making progress and we're giving relief to our healthcare workers. <clears throat> and we're trying to keep them uh, I'm there and we can let some of the people maybe in the future go back home and start to open up some elective surgery again. That's where we want to go. We've got to get there, but we're making progress, doing well. Next slide. Here's our vaccine ones. And this is a complicated one, but you can see across the whole province moving those numbers up. You can see a lot of numbers on the left-hand side, over 40%. That's our people over 18 and above, over 40%. Our 80 and above, well over 90%. And our ones over 70, close to 90%. We're getting there. 60s, getting up in the mid-70s. So we're doing that. The numbers of cases and deaths related to those, those age groups dropping off precipitously, especially in our long-term care homes and retirement homes. Shows you the vaccine does work, especially in the ones that have the less least capability to make it work. Because once you get over 80, 90, your immune system isn't as good as it was. As we go on the younger ones, we're getting better and better. And now we can do 12 to 18-year-olds. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. This has major impact. This is a game changer. And we're going to keep marking this. And this, especially for your sector, is a very important part to deal with, especially with your staff members that are in that 18 to 30 year age group. We need to get there. And we got more vaccine coming this week, more we've seen before. So we're driving those numbers down. But you need the vaccine and you need two or three weeks for it to take effect on you. It isn't instantaneous. Some people still think I got the vaccine, I can go scot free. Not the case. You need time. Next slide. So our key findings. One, <clears throat> our, our numbers are high. The variants are still concerning. Our variants are still responsive to the vaccine. Even the 617 you hear from India, uh, it's still being analyzed. We're still showing good effect in there. Our cases and our ICU occupancy is concerning. Our work of our public measures is impactful. We are bringing the numbers down while we wait for the vaccine to get caught up. It's a race against time, but we're winning on it, I feel. And so we're making headway. Therefore, we have to keep our measures in a little bit longer to get those numbers down. Why is that? <clears throat> if you open and come back down again, it's really devastating to the public. And I found, especially in areas of yours, the public, while you have some people are very vociferous on what they'd like to open right now, some of the public saying, we're not sure it's safe yet. We'd rather have when we open, the public say, we're confident it is safe. And you don't want just 20% of your business come back you want all of them coming back. Can we think about getting summer camps open again? How do we do that safely? Now we're doing 12 to 18 year olds. We may be around the corner from getting five to 12 year olds done, but how do we do all those things? So we can open up safely, effectively and stay open because we don't want a fourth wave. We don't even want to see it. That's where we want to drive it. Next slide, I'm gonna finish there. And, and that's the end of my presentation there. So my overall message is, <clears throat> um, we're doing steadfast, steadfast work on this. We're making great progress. Our Ontarians in general are confident in what we're doing. They feel reassured it's safe, reassured enough they're advocating for more to open. That's what you want to have. But you don't want to open people saying, eh, I don't think so, I'm not confident. I think I'll just stay away. When we open, we want to be able to open and saying, it's safe to do it, go ahead and do it. And we know we can give you reassurance on that. And we want to be able to say that to Ontarians writ large, We've done a great job so far, and we can do that together. So enjoy your lunch and minister any final comments before I go on to my next meeting. But appreciate working with you on all these ones here and with the sector. I'm ordering in once a week as much as I can. <laughs> um, 
And um, I'm not saying my wife's cooking isn't good, but that's fine. She needs a break. <clears throat> yeah, she does need a break. And Dr. Williams, uh, you've been a trooper for this. Uh, you need a break too sometimes. So I'm glad that you're being spoiled uh, with your takeout and delivery. I want to say thank you for taking the time here. I know I know what your meetings are about this afternoon. And I know uh, it's been uh, behind the scenes. I don't think people see us uh, sometimes in those eight or 10 hour cabinet meetings of which you're part of as well, sometimes late into a Friday night and uh, really trying to get us at a safe point where we can reopen. I did personally feel, I mean, I look at those charts with uh, the, the, the average um, is over 40% now in most communities across Ontario where we're getting vaccinated 18 plus and that continues to happen. I got my vaccination on Friday, um, felt it over the weekend, that's for sure. But, um, and it was AstraZeneca. So please don't worry about the vaccine, just go get it. And, uh, and we'll, we'll continue to work with Dr. David Williams. And before you go, uh, Dr., Dr., Dr. Williams, um, I think I've said this to you many times, um, in, but whether it's on sport culture heritage or uh, the tourism side, uh, Colleen and uh, Allison have been impeccable to work with with my team. And uh, I know who would have thought that the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Heritage would be as linked as they are. But uh, in a pandemic, um, they are they are natural allies because we were the first hit, hardest hit will take the longest to recover. And you are the public health experts that are guiding us through. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, good luck this afternoon. And uh, we'll we'll be chatting with you either tomorrow or when. Wednesday. Thank you, Minister. We'll keep working on that. As I said, I get to do some talking, but my team behind me, like Alice and others, they do all the walking and your team as well. So it's that they're working together in a real tight partnership and we'll continue to make progress on this steadfastly towards opening up things safely and, and keep it open. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's exactly what we want. We want in the best interest so we don't have to stop, start, keep moving back and forth. We want to be firm that when we open that we're going to have a summer season uh, and it might be a little bit later than we'd want. We don't want to be rolling things back and we certainly don't want to put people's lives at risk. So uh, thank you very much and, and all the very best. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to turn it over to somebody who I'm, I'm, I've known, I think, for the past 20 years, but has been uh, no stranger to any of you uh, because we have uh, we have uh, asked him and secured him to do a number of different um, uh, uh, public opinion pieces for us with respect to consumer uh, behaviors and habits. Um, but what I thought today, rather than just look at Ontario, is because um, Daryl is, 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 as the president and CEO of Ipsos, part of a, an international network, is to really look at uh, what the trends are, what the, what the behaviors are um, as a result of things like vaccination, why will people want to travel again, and, and that sort of thing. So today, this isn't research that has been um, uh, procured by this ministry. Uh, this is data that, uh, that Daryl has uh, been able to collaborate on with his colleagues uh, around the world and provide us with a global sense of what's happening, where, why, and when. So, so Daryl, thank you for always being there for me. And I know this will be a very interesting part of um, the conversation for a lot of people in terms of what Dr. Williams said is the health conditions. Well, when the health conditions are right, what does that actually mean? And you're gonna be able to provide a lot of insight. And just before I turn it over to you, remember everybody, we wanna get local for lunch trending today on Twitter and Instagram. So hashtag local for lunch. Let's support those local restaurants that have had been so hard hit um, you know, we have over a thousand people on this call. We have probably 1400. If every one of us does that, we'll trend. And if every one of us bought a meal today, that's 1400 meals across the province of Ontario to our hardworking restaurateurs. So Daryl, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, somebody putting up my slides or am I doing my own? Um, oh, somebody's putting them up. Okay. So uh, as the minister said, what I'm going to focus on today is putting Canada in context and Ontario into context. So taking a look at what's happening around the world, because if you're in the travel and tourism sector, if you're somebody who's reliant on dollars coming into the country, uh, I think it'd be a good idea to see who it is that's going to be more comfortable with traveling and how Canadians in particular feel about, uh, feel about travel. So if we could go to the next uh, slide, please. So international context, next slide, please. So this is a survey that we do every couple of weeks at Ipsos, uh, in which we ask 15 different countries what they think about what's going on with COVID. So these are the results coming out from the very end of April. And what you the, there's two questions here. Uh, in green, I feel like things in my country are out of control right now. And uh, in purple, I think there will be another wave of COVID-19 infections in my country. So what you see across the world 
is this growing sense that there's going to be another wave of infection if they haven't gone through it yet. So as, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Williams was, was saying before, people feel like they're in the midst of a battle right now. And that while things may not be completely out of control, uh, that we've got a lot of progress to, uh, to make prior to feeling like we're going to be getting back to where we need to be. So I know that there's a lot of people out there who are anxious and they're advocating for opening things up quickly and moving quickly. The public mood isn't there right now. And by the way, when I point to Canada, which is uh, just a couple in from the left, uh, right next to the United States, um, when we talk about Ontario, uh, the Canadian population is about 38 million people. The Ontario population is uh, close to 15 million. So about 40% of Canada right now uh, are people who live in Ontario. They're very strongly represented in the numbers for Canada. And I would say uh, Ontario in general is very close to the Canadian average. So as you can see, Brazil, India, Japan, then Canada. And those other three places have been getting a lot in the news about the situation that they're in. Canada is not far, that far behind them. Next slide, please. So uh, as we were going through March, and this is looking at two country, uh, two questions, I feel like things in my country are out of control right now. And then the performance of government, specifically the federal government, in terms of their management of this issue. What you see is that we crossed the line back in March. At the end of March, as we went into April, as we started to move back into more lockdowns, where people started to get really concerned again. And in fact, much more concerned than they were at the start of the, uh, at the, start of the pandemic. So this is a particularly precarious situation uh, in terms of public opinion, as Dr. Williams said. I know that the people who are out there protesting about opening things up seem like they represent a, a large segment of the Ontario population. They actually aren't. The vast majority of Ontarians right now are thinking that we're in a precarious situation and that we need to be careful about reopening, which I'm gonna show you in just a second. So next slide, please. Um, this is a 15 uh, country study, as I said, came out just at the end of April. Thinking about resuming normal activities act after the pandemic makes me feel very anxious, is in the orange uh, bar. And we should restart the economy and allow businesses to open up or operate as they choose. As you can see in Canada, we're right in the middle of the pack. We're not especially anxious, but then again, we're not especially uh, keen about opening things up again, as quickly as people in many other countries. In fact, we're near the bottom of the list when it comes to the, the rest of the world. So Canadians are still uh, fairly tentative about coming out. Maybe that's one of the reasons that they're not feeling as anxious because they don't think things are being opened, opened up too quickly at the moment. Next slide, please. So supportive initiatives, closing the borders to anyone from another country closing the borders to anyone from another province, state, or region. On the left-hand side, and this goes from closing the borders to anyone from the country at the high down to uh, from Canada to Mexico. So the people who are most supportive of closing the borders of anybody in the world that we've interviewed over the space of the last couple of weeks are Canadians. So the uh, premier uh, putting in those demands to the federal government about closing the borders uh, was right aligned with Canadian public opinion because they do feel that this is something that's coming in from other places, both internationally, but also domestically. Next slide, please. Perceived risk of taking a vacation uh, has gone up. Canada is number two in the world in terms of uh, reluctance to take a vacation. It's fact gone up over seven points from the last time we asked this about a month ago. Mexico is at the top of the list, Japan, China are at the bottom of the list. And as probably as you can see from the international data, the US is obviously not as anxious about a lot of questions as Canada, Canada is or Canadians are, but there's still a fair amount of anxiety in the United States as well. Uh, but China is clearly in another direction on these issues where they have, uh, uh, they've pretty much feel that they've, they've turned the corner. Next slide, please. Perceived risk of dining uh, in at, at a restaurant. Again, um, Canadians, pretty anxious about that. It's gone up a little bit. 67% uh, of Canadians say that they're anxious about that right now. China's in another place. Australia is obviously in another place too. Uh, you can see that that number is dropping in a couple of countries, like for example, France in the US where things are starting to open up a bit more. But in Canada, the number has actually been moving in the other direction. Vaccines. 
So um, one of the things that gets a lot of attention right now in the press is the issue of vaccine hesitancy. The word hesitant is not very precise, but it does define what it is that people are feeling about vaccines at the moment, but not in the sense of anti-vaccination. It's not like people are saying, I'm never going to get vaccinated. What we really see is instead of a, a, almost like a light switch where you turn this off and you turn this on, it's more like a dial. It's more like a dimmer switch. There's a whole bunch of people in Canada right now, 53% of us, over half of us, say that I would immediately get vaccinated as soon as I could possibly get vaccinated. Add in another uh, 25, it takes us almost up to 80% of the population saying in Canada that they want to have access to vaccines relatively quickly. So we don't have an anti-vax problem in Canada right now. We don't have an anti-vax problem, significant anti-vax problem in Ontario. What we have is a, 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 an access to vaccines problem in the province. So that's a matter of supply and distribution. There is a very um, uh, demanding uh, uh, a situation right now in the province of Ontario where there is less vaccine available, even though we're making progress on this, as Dr. Williams was talking about, the demand is still far ahead of the uh, the actual progress. And the people who strongly disagree about getting a vaccine is basically only one in 10. If you look at things like for flu vaccines, for example, the number of pe percentage of people in Ontario that get a flu vaccine is way, way lower than the percentage that want to get access to a, a COVID vaccine. Who are the people who are the most reluctant? Actually, you're getting into the Russia, Russia and the US right now in the world. But if you look at Brazil, Mexico, India, all places that are having a tough time with this right now, uh, more vaccines, please. Next slide. Timeline to get a vaccine in Canada, which is in the middle of the chart, immediately 54%. People who are, well, who are saying, I'm not sure about this, only about 10, and only over uh, six months is only three. So the vast majority of people in the Canadian population, we see similar numbers for Ontario, in fact, exactly the same numbers for Ontario, want something relatively quickly. The idea that there's this huge population of people who don't want to be vaccinated, simply not true. Next slide, please. Immunization cert certification to the, enter the country. Now, this is a very messy slide. I apologize for that. Uh, but what you'll see is if you read down the table at about the midpoint, about 78% of Canadians say that they want some form of immunization certification for anybody to enter the country. And by the way, similar opinion across the world, lower in places like Belgium, Russia, Poland, and Hungary, but still majorities in those places too. Where this debate is going to move from, as we get more access to vaccines and more and more people are vaccinated, is people demonstrating that they've been vaccinated to be able to do things in their lives. So that will be one more pressure point for people to get vaccinated because there's very strong support to travel to be vaccinated. Next slide, please. Uh, immunization certificate effectiveness. Do you think it'll actually work? Most people do think that it'll work, which is probably underscores the point of why it is in these 28 countries that people want to see uh, more um, uh, uh, access uh, to, or people uh, having a responsibility to demonstrate that they've been vaccinated in order to do things like travel and, and attend large events. That's what's going to make people safe. In fact, we did look at in other surveys at whether or not testing would have an effect on making people feel safe to attend uh, to attend events again, and uh, it didn't have nearly the same impact as people being able to demonstrate that they've been vaccinated. Next slide, please. And immunization certification to access all large public venues. In Canada, 35 plus 30, 65% saying that they agree that this should probably be required in order for people to attend uh, large pub public uh, uh, engagements. You see the numbers drop off in other places, but in, in countries like, for example, India, Ch India, Chile, Malaysia, Peru, and Turkey, it's pretty much mandatory. Uh, um, as far as the public is concerned. Next slide, please. Expected wide usage of immunization certification by the end of the year. So what this says is how long uh, do you think that, um, uh, or how much do you agree or disagree that vaccine passports or something like that will be widely used in your country by the end of the year? 
basically what people are saying is uh, we're very strongly believing that this is going to be required. So again, another pressure point for people uh, to obtain a vaccine. In Canada, we're saying 61% of us say uh, that this will probably be required. Only 10% say they strongly disagree with that. Next slide, please. Immunization certification to access shops, restaurants, and offices. Uh, this is where you start to see things break down. So it's only 49% of Canadians think that we need, we need to be able to demonstrate that we've, uh, we've been vaccinated in order to access shops, restaurants, and offices. But that's still nearly, uh, well, that still is half of, half of us feeling like that it should be required. 18% of us say that it shouldn't. But I would expect as we go through the summertime and as we start getting into the fall, that this is where the issue is going to move to. It's going to be how do you demonstrate that you're vaccinated in order to be able to do certain types of things that you used to be able to do, especially when it comes to travel. Next, please. Limiting activities involving large groups of people only to those who've been vaccinated. In Canada, 61% say that that should be the case. France, it's only 43, obviously a higher number in Brazil, but in Canada, very similar to the United States on this. Next slide, please. Length of time immunization certification should be required for activities or travel. Look at the dark blue on this and then work your way from the right to the left. So how long should it be enforced? Dark blue is indefinitely, lighter blue for the next several years, slightly lighter blue, at least for the end of the year. If you look at Canada, if you add up 17 plus 26 plus 32, you're to three quarters of the population saying till at least the end of the year. About half of us are pushing into half of us saying it will probably be for the next several years or indefinitely. So as I said before, this is where the discussion is moving. It's moving from, uh, opening up uh, or having access to vaccines in order to be able to open up and then to open up more to be able to prove that you've been vaccinated. Next slide, please. And that is the final slide. Uh, back to you, Minister. I hope they get, gave uh, everybody some context to work how Canada fits into the world. Thank you. Yeah, look, it's 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 excellent work. Um, you've always been so open uh, with us and uh, this, this was really important for us to see this uh, where we fit into the world. And I know I saw someone had texted me to see if uh, your slide would be available for email. Are we able to do that for distribution or is this a private deck? It's Just a private sure. deck. With 1400 people. <laughs> yeah, my, okay. colleagues would, my colleagues would kill me. If I can't okay, not a problem. We're happy to, we're happy to accommodate that. But um, I have a couple other questions for you just because of the, the stuff you and I have been working on and we've talked about and um, we haven't been in the field recently. So, uh, you know, if, if you can't really respond, perhaps you could provide, um, uh, you know, my, my, my industry partners and sector leaders um, with, with some insights on some of the stuff we've been seeing and we've been talking about. And the first one is really many of the people on this call, um, you know, would rely on volunteers, whether that's in uh, children's sports, um, our museums and our archives across the province. Um, our festivals and events, we happen to have the largest volunteer sector underneath uh, this ministry um, in Canada. And so we're just, you know, when they start to go back to their, their folks and say, you know, can you come in and, and take a shift at the Nepea Museum? Or can you come out and coach the Windsor Little League team? Or can you come out and, and help, um, you know, one of the, you know, uh, the festival here uh, in Pride? Uh, in Toronto. Uh, what are you seeing there in terms of people's likelihood to get back? What would it take for them to get back? And and also the other component is um, is the donation piece, because many of these organizations also uh, thrive off of donations. Yeah, it's, it's interesting on these questions. Uh, on the issue of donations, what we're seeing in the data is people are not saying that they're necessarily reluctant to donate. And I expect is People are more confident about the economy at this moment uh, that if you had fundraising drives going on, they may not be, you know, the, the, the boom um, that, uh, uh, that you may have had in previous situations when the economy is, is booming, for example. But uh, people are at least saying on surveys that they're not reluctant to donate. So I wouldn't be reluctant to go out and ask people uh, for either donating stuff which they tell us they're prepared to do or donating money, there still seems to be some desire 
to do that. Where we run into issues is anything that involves people's physical presence, and that's where they're reluctant. And the reason is because they, they're worried about exposure to, uh, uh, to COVID. So I would say that dealing with volunteers in some ways is almost like dealing with customers right now. The same, the same issues that customers have are the same issues that volunteers have. So it's about their safety. It's about this issue of being vaccinated to be safe and then making sure that the environment that they're going to be put into uh, is, uh, is, uh, is going to be safe for their health. So yeah. I think that, that's what we're seeing in the, in the surveying anyway. And then just on, on to expand on that, because we talked a lot about vaccines and, and people's comfort with the, the vaccine and, and whether or not they would expect some type of a passport or whatever proof. Um, in terms of, of um, gaining entry into like getting volunteers back or even getting people like fans into stands, um, is rapid testing something that, that tests high or is it the vaccines? Like people just want those vaccines in people's arms and, and the case count going down lower. Yeah, the rapid testing doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence. I mean, compared to the vaccines, uh, it, it just uh, it didn't have it doesn't get similar kinds of numbers. I mean, I mean, anything that you can do to demonstrate that the situation is safe, obviously uh, has some impact. So, you know, requiring people to wear masks and, and, and doing things that, uh, uh, you know, social distancing and those kinds of things are all seen as positives. Uh, um, testing is not seen as a negative. But in terms of inspiring confidence that it would be okay for me to go to that place doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, um, and particularly when it, you compare it to things like vaccines. And you and I have, uh, over the past 14 months have talked a lot about um, what people's comfort level would be. In fact, you were very helpful in, in framing my mindset last summer when I went out on my, my uh, 11 week tour across Ontario. You told me, um, you know, you need to demonstrate that it's safe to, to resume activities by wearing your mask, physically distancing, washing your hands, following the rules if you're in a restaurant or going to a cultural attraction um, or going to a tourism attraction. And so, we, you know, some of the advice we provided my agencies, but also with the sector was um, to start getting those videos up to demonstrate that you can do, do things safely. Um, so, I, I, you know, that was very helpful for me. But more broadly speaking, we've been looking at this stuff for 14 months now, and many of us have uh, to showcase that we can do things safely if, if you know, when, when it's safe to do so. Um, you know, more broadly speaking, in terms of consumer sentiments and behavior, you know, have, have people's willingness to either go to a live concert, go to children's sports events, um, going to a museum. Have, have you seen a dramatic increase of people wanting to do that while you've been looking through the data? Or is there still a significant reticence until the majority of the population is um, is uh, vaccinated, uh, will they want to get back? So I know, you know, you and I look at a number of different sectors, and I'm just I'm just for the benefit of the uh, of our studio audience, if they if we shall call them that, um, and our our friends across the province is, um, and I'll and I'll wrap it up this way: just because it opens doesn't mean people will come. And then maybe you could look at a couple of those sectors that I just mentioned. Yes, yeah, so there's there's two parts to this, Minister. The, the first part is. Uh, the easiest, I think, to, to communicate, which is it's really a combination of two things, uh, location and numbers. So if you uh, have an indoor situation, the smaller the numbers, um, and roughly when you go out and you test it, it's, it's somewhere between five and 10. Um, uh, people are okay maybe attending an event like that because they, they think that they, they're able to control their situation. If you're outdoors, the numbers go up. They're, they're, they're roughly double or, or, or more. So it's, and we've seen the numbers improving on this. So as people get more experience with dealing with all of this, they're, they're really um, manipulating those two variables in their mind to determine safety, which is the type of location, the type of activity I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be in, particularly if it's going to be enclosed, or, and then also the number of people who are going to be involved. But uh, you know, as I said at the start of this, uh, or I may have been saying to somebody before, the way to look at this is not as uh, like a light switch where they're going off and on. It's more like a dimmer switch. Um, and what you'll find is that the, the Ontario population divides itself into a, 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 a series of groups, about five or six. And, and uh, when it comes to doing things like re-engaging uh, with, uh, say, for example, going to restaurants or going out to venues or traveling, going to hotels, uh, there is a hardcore group, maybe 20% of the population that's ready to go now, whatever the conditions. And if you, if, particularly if they're vaccinated, so they're ready to go now, but it's another 80% who aren't. They need to see more, they need to see more proof. 
The next group really wants to see what's happening with the first group. And the big thing for them is they have to understand what it's going to look like. So the minister modeling what the behavior is supposed to be is an important thing because what it shows people is she's taking it seriously. The people she's around are taking it seriously and therefore they should take it seriously and the situation will be well run. So your employees, for example, if you're running a restaurant, them modeling safe behavior uh, absolutely ruthlessly is important to be able to demonstrate to everybody who's waiting in line that you're taking it seriously. So that's the next group. Then there's another group after that who don't have access to transportation. They don't have the money to be able to go out and, and do things. Uh, as conditions become safer and they're able to get their lives back on track, they're going to come back out. Then there's the group after that, which are really, um, they tend to unfortunately be more affluent people. Uh, they tend to be disproportionately older. Uh, their lives are going quite well under lockdown right now. They're not particularly anxious to move back out and engage with society. They have to see everything working okay for those other people before they're prepared to jump back in. So whatever is going to happen is not going to be immediate. But even when you add 20% to 15 million people or look at 20% of 15 million people, that's still a really, really big number. So, you know, the minute that some of these things open up and that they're going to be safe, you're going to see a lot of people go out, but it's not going to be the full population re-engaged the way that they were before. It's going to take some time. Yeah, and, and, and I think, uh, too, when looking last summer, we had a bit of a reprieve, uh, particularly in the more uh, rural and um, suburban communities. That, I mean, Toronto and Ottawa were particularly hard hit, and I think that's going to be a struggle getting back because of the business travel and uh, getting, um, you know, international visitors back. But what do you think in terms of this summer? And I think Dr. Williams expressed, uh, you know, some optimism that if we continue to hold the line and we continue to focus um, and the, the, the case numbers continue to come down, more vaccines in people's arms, uh, you know, I'll ask you the first question on tourism. And then I'm going to ask the same question, I think, in sport um, is, do you see people uh, traveling across Ontario this summer, um, what is their comfort level based on you know the the, the research that you've been doing, and um, and what would incentivize them to sort of uh, take in some hyper local activity? The, the there will be people if we open back up that will want to travel. It won't be like what it was um, uh, because it's going to take some time. Remember, it's not a switch; it's a, it's a it's a dimmer switch. It's a, it's going to take some time for people to. To, to queue in and, and, and to uh, see what they need in order to be uh, happy um, that, that something's going to be safe. But the two things everybody's going to be watching is the number of cases. They have to be trending in the right direction. And the medical authorities have to be saying that stuff is safe, that we're reopening and it's going to be safe. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is they have to be able to see with their own eyes. So I think video is incredibly important on this, websites, pictures, anything that you can show. Uh, what the experience is going to be like. If it looks like it's going to be worth it and it looks like it's going to be safe because the data and people are watching these things like hawks, like almost like weather reports, um, well, actually exactly like weather reports, even more so, uh, that the cases are going down and that people who are going to be engaged in what they're doing are going to be vaccinated, then you'll get people back. And I would say the same thing applies to sports as well. We've seen this in data with parents in terms of their willingness to have their kids go to you know, out-of-town tournaments and that kind of thing. There's reluctance to do that unless the conditions that I just described for tourism and you know, moving around the province, unless those conditions are satisfied generally, it's, it's gonna, the same thing is going to apply uh, to any sports as well. Yeah, so in two, two, another I'll make a point and then another question, if, if you don't mind. Um, you know, we do have the travel incentive, hopefully, God willing, um, coming out on July 1st, that will be 20% uh, tax um, credit uh, across the province. Only we're going to launch that when it's safe to do so. And as we've seen before, I mean, I was about set to uh, announce the opening of the OHL and the third wave hit. Uh, myself and the Premier and the Finance Minister were in Niagara Falls uh, and, uh, you know, within you know, within days, we were into a situation where, you know, we were back into a stay at home order. Uh, so things are rapidly changing. So we've got to continue to monitor it. Um, what in terms of um, because I don't I know I probably have a lot of sport folks on here. Um, I, I'm a hockey mom myself. And I know uh, when I, I you know, I, 
when I start to look at the numbers and, and I, you'll, I'll, you'll, you'll make a comment on this too, because you're actually saying people don't even need the, they, they, they know the numbers themselves. They can assess the numbers themselves yeah. now better than anything. And so as a mom, I've started to learn that. So I you know, took Tor out of school and took her out of hockey at, at one point. Um, and so I'm just wondering in terms of incentivizing parents to get kids back into sport, that's going to be a big job in this ministry. And, you know, we've uh, invested in sport for Ontario to look at how we can best do that. But do you have any insights for the provincial sport organizations who are on here that we're going to continue to fund? Don't worry about that, guys. We're going to continue to fund you, even though you're shuttered. But we want to make sure that when it's safe to do so, we get back up. But that we might only have a fraction of the kids back. And so how, how would you respond to that, uh, Daryl? Well, I think that, you know, the provincial government, it's uh, getting the cases down, getting the vaccines up, obviously, priority one. Uh, if there's incentives for people to, to, to participate in some of these things, some people will, uh, that, that'll appeal to them. So maybe that 20% group moves up to 25 or whatever. But then it, it really, it, it moves on to the people who are running these things and really managing that's, that, what that experience is going to be like, demonstrating to people what the experience is going to be like, and that it's going to be safe and it's going to be fun and that you're going to get out of it what you uh, what what uh, what you expect to get out of it. So there's you can open everything up and you can say that you know there's incentives to do things, but until people feel that uh, it's as I said before, it's going to be worth it and that it's going to be safe in that spot, they're only the people who are the bravest are going to give it a try. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that has been interesting for me because I've I've done some extensive research into this, as you know, looking at the jurisdictional scans, presenting the Jobs and Recovery Committee um, and Economic Resource Policy Committee on, on what does this reopening look like? And again, uh, one of the things I said it earlier, and I'll say it again, is just because we open doesn't mean they're going to come. And I think that's going to be a big challenge for us um, as, as we go through this pandemic. And um, hopefully, as Dr. Williams says, we don't get a fourth wave we get enough people vaccinated, we, we, we stay the course and, and level out. Um, do you have any other insights, Daryl, that you want to share? We only have a few more minutes left and uh, that we didn't cover. Uh, you and I have had so many conversations about this over the past uh, 14 months, uh, 15 months almost, um, that uh, you know, you've probably um, forgotten more than most people know about a lot of this stuff. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I, I would say that um, you know, these are busy charts um, there are a lot of numbers that Dr. Williams and I walked you through, but just remember every one of these digits is a person and they're people just like you and whatever worries or concerns or thoughts that you have about this are, and your neighbors have about it and your friends have it, your social circle have about it. That's really what is reflected in what's going on. In what everybody else is thinking. So um, it's, it's, I think it's important to keep in mind that all of these data are really a reflection of specific conversations with individual people telling us, you know, in a more structured way, what it is that they're thinking about something. And that if you recognize yourself in these numbers, you should be. If you recognize your concerns in these numbers, you should be. What you're feeling is what everybody else is feeling. So think about what the experience has to look like for you. And that's probably what it needs to look like for your customers, for your volunteers, for anybody that you wanna to try to bring into your establishment. So if you can satisfy yourself in terms of your safety concerns and what you would want if you were walking into that restaurant and that the experience is going to be what you would hope that it's going to be, what you would demand it to be, that's exactly what everybody else is looking for. So that's gonna be the challenge. Can we make it look like it's worthwhile combined with are we able to live up to the, our customers' expectations? Uh, everything that I've seen is I think that people are enthusiastic about doing this. They're getting a lot of tips about how to do this. They're understanding the behavior science around this. They're understanding what their role is in doing all of this. And I think that, uh, that things are gonna move relatively well and maybe even more swiftly than we're anticipating if we have some good trial and experience when things start to open up, but that's what it's gonna take. Excellent. Well, listen, Daryl, you've always been so uh, open and accommodating to uh, me and our team uh, and helping us understand uh, where Ontarians are uh, with the public health crisis from a social and economic standpoint. And uh, 
Really uh, grateful that you joined us today. Um, and I look forward to continued working with you. And, and I know your insights have been very helpful to uh, the organizations that are here today, the people that represent the hardest hit sectors and what does recovery mean? And um, it's been very helpful for us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, folks, just before we uh, we say adieu, um, I wanted to thank all of you for being on here, um, for contributing to 1400 uh, lunches or more uh, being purchased across Ontario today for Restaurants Canada and Orma members. And we wanna make sure that we, uh, as diverse as we are, as a set of a suite of stakeholders and sectors, uh, we are intertwined. We are what makes Ontario the greatest place to live, work and play. Uh, we're, the, we're the reason together that people wanna visit our province. Um, and we're the reason together that, the, that uh, this place makes great memories. And we will do that again, I promise you. I, I promise you, I continue to work with our public health leaders and our public opinion experts to uh, meticulously guide our ministry through this pandemic. Uh, I know I'm not perfect, uh, but I do speak for you every single day around the cabinet table and with the premier. Um, and sometimes I win, sometimes I don't, uh, but let's uh, focus and leave on a very positive note. Um, we did get a billion dollars worth of support in the budget. Um, and that's on top of uh, the $625 million that flowed. Um, in addition to my allocation last year. So uh, make sure that you're looking at these programs. As I mentioned, I'll be doing a big announcement on Thursday um, and there'll be some more announcements coming as we continue to uh, fine tune uh, some of these programs in order for us to, to be part and carve out our place in the social and economic recovery of the province of Ontario. Um, you know, I, I continue to talk to public health about what the thresholds and criteria will be for everything from kids and camps to those um, tourism operations, water parks, theme parks, boat tour operators, golf courses, outdoor amenities, all of that. Please know uh, that, that I continue to work on those with the right people and that uh, our team is dedicated to you. Uh, we, we wanna make sure that you do succeed, but you succeed um, when, when we're in the right conditions. And I think today's uh, Lunch and Learn was very helpful for that. So again, thank you very much. And folks, again, if you can just help us get that hashtag trending local for lunch. And uh, if you found this to be um, insightful, if you found it to be helpful, or if you have any questions, uh, please let us know at minister.mcleod at ontario.ca. Again, minister.mcleod at ontario.ca. And my team uh, over the next couple of days will be going through that uh, that uh, email account. I will warn you, however, uh, there have been a couple of um, uh, campaigns over the weekends and the last couple of weeks that have uh, filled that inbox up pretty high. So they're working around the clock at trying to help you out. So everyone, thank you. Uh, hashtag local for lunch. Daryl, uh, always a pleasure. And to my friends across Ontario, I can't wait to see you when the time is right and uh, and to be with you and um and, and to really celebrate uh, the end of COVID-19 and the economic and social recovery of the province of Ontario. So thank you very much. And that's our time for today. Thanks, Daryl.